Hey everyone, my name is Shanice and welcome back to my channel. Today I will be going over some of the books that I desperately want to get to by the end of the year. These books are big chunky books, so over 500 pages. There are a few that are maybe on the shorter end of the long side, so like more in the mid 400s, but you know, still relatively big and intimidating and ones that I've put off for many, many, many years. They have been sitting on my shelves for, again, many, many, many years, too many years, honestly. And, you know, I've previously mentioned in a few videos that one of the challenges I do monthly is to read one of these books. One, because they've been on my shelves for so long, um, but two, and mainly because I really want to get my physical TBR down to zero books. What better way to combine these two goals than to, you know, read a chunky book every month of the year. So in this video I will be going through the books that I plan on reading from July to December this year um, and then just briefly saying something about the books that I have already read this year and one book that I am currently reading. So yes, let us begin. As a quick run through of all the titles that I've read so far in the year since January. Um, in January I read Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. In February, I read The Famished Road by Ben Okri. In March, I read The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. In April, I read The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. In May, I read Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. And currently in June, I'm reading Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. So I've spoken more in depth about these titles except for Wolf Hall because I'm currently reading it. Um, I've spoken about these all in previous monthly wrap-ups, so go check those out. Um, and I even did a reading vlog uh, about my very long experience reading Don Quixote. So yeah, check those out if you wish. Um, I had a really fun time making them. Now I do want to comment on one thing that's going to be pretty evident uh, as I go through this list, and that is the lack of diversity in the authors. Um, I know maybe some of you are rolling your eyes like, oh, you know, why should it matter? Like, this is something that's actually really important to me. I think it was a shortcoming of my early reading life, which is where I collected a lot of these books that are sitting on my shelves. Um, you know, when I was a younger reader, I just wanted to read what everybody said was important. So. Typically, those are the classics, and as we know, a lot of, if not most of, what we know and consider and regard as classic books are written by a very homogenous group of people from a similar class, similar race, similar gender, similar sexual orientation, like, it's all very homogenous. Um, and so when I was younger, sadly, I didn't question this, I just accepted it and didn't analyze it, didn't think further about how problematic that is and how limiting of a worldview that provides readers. You know, you're only learning about like one kind of experience and not all of the experiences. And that also, you know, brings to question what we mean by canon and who gets to decide what goes in the canon and what is then worthy of being studied and read in school and what is worthy of being considered a classic and part of the canon. Once you really start asking yourself these questions as a reader, I think your experience with literature just expands and hopefully naturally diversifies. And so like reading diversely is not something performative to me. It's very much at the core of my being and my belief system. And honestly, if I'm just picking out books today as a contemporary reader, I would naturally go for more diverse points of view and voices. A lot of my interests lie in, you know, post-colonial studies and immigrant stories and you know, perspectives from marginalized authors. And so I typically would gravitate towards that. But like I said, because I want to tackle my physical TBR, which is sadly very homogenous because of all the books I collected when I was younger, you know, the books that are parts of these challenges for my year, um, at least for the next like two years are going to be sadly a little bit homogenous um, with a few exceptions. Because these are just monthly challenges for me, you know, I balance it out naturally with the other books that I read in the month. 
Um, so overall, like my reading isn't suddenly going to change in terms of who is represented, but you know, it, it's something that's going to be pretty obvious when I go through these titles. Um, and I just wanted to point that out because yeah, this is an issue that I take very seriously as a reader. Um, it's something that I'm always considering when I pick up a new book. So yeah, just wanting to let you guys know that I am aware, but uh, blame young Shanice for this issue. But anyway, let us now jump to the books that I will be reading uh, from July all the way to December. Okay, so my challenge for the month of July, which is my birthday month, I wanted to choose something that sort of evokes summer or at least heat that, that just gives the atmosphere of like a, a warm climate. The one that I chose that has been on my shelves for too long is East of Eden by John Steinbeck. It was published in 1952. My copy is 601 pages. Like many kids in the United States, I had to read The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck um, and Of Mice and Men throughout my either like high school years or college years. Steinbeck is essential to US American literature. East of Eden is what Steinbeck himself called his most accomplished novel. Um, he regards this as the one where he could really pour all that he has learned about writing and his craft into. Um, so this is considered like his magnum opus. And from what I know about the novel, it follows two families, the Trask family and the Hamilton family, and sees how they intertwine throughout a few decades. Um, it's very much intergenerational and sweeping, it has themes of love and loss and identity, and it is sort of a, a reenactment or a retelling of the biblical stories of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. So it has this sort of grandiose background um, and history that it's in conversation with. So I think this is going to be a favorite for me. Um, I love intergenerational stories. I love stories that, you know, trace people throughout decades and years and all of that. I feel like I'm going to love it. And who doesn't want to read a good book in their birthday month. So yes, East of Eden is my July pick. For August, I am actually still not sure which book I'm going to read, but I have sort of narrowed it down to two. One is Dune by Frank Herbert, which was published in 1965 and is 794 pages. The other book is Roots by Alex Haley, which was published in 1976 and is 912 pages. Now I'm still unsure which one I'm going to pick. Um, I think I sort of am more interested in reading Roots, but I feel like because it's also this sweeping generational story, I might want a break from that having just read East of Eden, but I'm not gonna lie, you know, I've put off Dune for a long time because I just get this vibe and then I may not like it. And I'm sort of afraid to pick that up for that reason. Um, and I saw a review by Sunbeams Jess, um, who's one of my favorite booktubers slash like beauty guru type people. I don't know. She does a lot on her channel, but I remember watching her review of Dune and she mentioned that she had mixed feelings about it. She didn't love it all that much and that there was like some problematic use of the Middle East worked into the novel. And honestly, I haven't heard anybody else say anything about that, but that's something that would definitely put me off. And I haven't watched the movie adaptation uh, directed by Denis Villeneuve, but my friend started watching it and she also sort of had this complaint that the fictional Middle East that is kind of the main setting of the world in Dune, if it's intentionally supposed to be a parallel to like the real Middle East in, you know, our world, there is just some unsettling <laughs> things being said and like unsettling portrayals of people and culture. So, so I don't know. Um, but Dune is like a hot, arid kind of novel. I feel like it fits August. And again, it's like a break from a novel like East of Eden, which is very dramatic and very family and like generationally driven. Like maybe I want 
a genre switch up for August. So yeah, unsure as of now, but those are my two options. And just to give a little bit of a summary about both, um, in case you guys didn't know, um, so Dune follows a boy called Paul Atreides. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not sure. Um, but he comes from a noble family uh, who is ruling over this land, and this land is known for producing a very valuable spice, um, I think called melange, and this spice extends people's lives um, amongst other really valuable qualities. And so one day the house of Atreides is betrayed and destroyed, I think, and so the story sort of follows Paul from that point. Um, how he maybe avenges his family, what he does to bring justice to what happened, and fulfill his destiny. I really hope that if I do choose this one for August, um, the story is more interesting than that summary. As for Roots, what it's about, it is considered a fiction novel, but it is largely autobiographical, if not like totally autobiographical. So it starts off in the 18th century um, with Kunta Kinte, who is uh, sold into slavery and then transported to a Virginia plantation. Um, and so the book goes through all of his descendants leading up to Alex Haley, who is the writer of the novel slash autobiography. I think some people call it like a genealogical detective story, um, which I think sounds really really fascinating. Obviously going to be very harrowing and traumatic and tragic, um, which is also like, do I necessarily want that in August? This decision for August is going to be tough, <laughs> um, but I'll, I guess I'll see how I feel after reading East of Eden, how I feel at the end of July, just what my mood is, um, and then we'll see. But my two choices are Dune, like I said, or Roots. If any of you guys have read either book and have any, you know, particular fervor for one over the other, just let me know in the comments. Also, if you've seen the adaptations of both novels, like, are they any good? Which do you prefer? Because um, I know both Dune and Roots have had many filmic and TV show adaptations throughout the years. So um, yeah, just let me know what you think down below. Moving on to the month of September, um, I'm a little scared <laughs> um, and I'll tell you why in a second, um, but the book slash books that I've chosen for that month are The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. I say book slash books because like, as probably most of you already know, um, the Lord of the Rings was supposed to be one volume in a two volume set with the Simo. Oh god. What is it called? The Silmarillion. I apologize to diehard Tolkien fans. I am not one yet. So, yeah. Silmarillion. Um, but anyway, that was supposed to be volume two of a two volume set with volume one, Lord of the Rings. So what we know as, you know, the Fellowship of the Rings, the Two Towers and the Return of the King, all supposed to just be the Lord of the Rings. But you know, for financial purposes, they divided that one volume, The Lord of the Rings, into those three books and published them between 1954 and 1955. My one volume edition is 1031 pages. Now I've read books that are bigger than this. Some of the ones that I mentioned that I read in the first half of the year have been bigger than this. I'm worried about The Lord of the Rings specifically because I have started this book in the past and I only made it I think like 75% of the way through what is you know the Fellowship of the Ring. At the time I had no patience for it pretty much. All I can remember is that the hobbits really like to sing and Tolkien really likes to write the lyrics to all of their songs. Um, and, you know, they usually like to sing when they're happy. Um, the problem is that they're happy, like, all the time. And I remember them being in, like, the woods or the forest and, like, just getting really happy to see, like, a tree or a bush. And because they're happy, they want to start singing. And then they start singing. And then we get, like, seven pages of verse. Um, and then, you know, the song ends, then they keep moving in the woods, and then they come across another tree that they really like, and then they start stinging again, and I, like, was going insane. <laughs> like, it never ended, and 
Yeah, so I just recall having a very difficult time staying focused and interested in the story. Also, I remember the language being very like detail oriented, very dense. Um, it's obviously like high fantasy, has a lot of history and lore behind it. Um, so yeah, maybe I was just like too young to really appreciate it. I think like I'm more, a more mature reader today. Like I've read some dense kind of historical novels since then. So I just think I'm in a better mind space for the Lord of the Rings. Um, and also I'm dying to finally watch the movie adaptations. If you've noticed, I think most of the books that I buy have like a, a movie or a TV show adaptation. Um, that's always like really good incentive for me to finally pick up books. Um, and so yeah, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, beloved by book lovers and film lovers. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm gonna use the films to like motivate me more and more to finally pick up and finish The Lord of the Rings. Not that I really need to give a summary about The Lord of the Rings, but you know, just for the few who don't know what it's about, um, uh, basically we follow a few hobbits from the Shire on their quest to destroy the One Ring, um, which was created many, many years prior to the setting of the novel by the Dark Lord Sauron, who created the One Ring to kind of rule over all of Middle-earth. Um, and the One Ring was supposed to be the most powerful of the other rings of power. Again, I clearly have not read this, so pardon me if that's not like the best summary, but that's what I know. I'm gonna try to go with an open mind. <laughs> um, and anyway, that's like a couple of months away. I will finish The Lord of the Rings in September, and who knows, like maybe I'm gonna be like a huge Lord of the Rings fan by the end of this. Next is one of those books that I said was on the shorter end of like the big books that I'm going to read. Um, it's Shirley Jackson's complete short stories. I've already read a handful of her short stories and loved them. I mean, The Lottery, obviously. I think one of my favorite short stories ever, not just by Shirley Jackson, but just of any short story I've read before is The Demon Lover. It's not like explicit horror or mystery, but it's like so unsettling. I remember just feeling like someone was watching me and watching the narrator of the story. Jackson just like is a brilliant writer to me. So what better short story collection to tackle in October? Um, and also I'm planning on reading like Pet Cemetery uh, by Stephen King in October and that's already a chunky book. Um, so I figure like maybe I can just read a short story every day um, and it won't be as daunting as reading like a, a big chunky novel alongside Pet Cemetery, if that makes sense. But yeah, I feel like this will be like a perfect atmospheric pick for October and I already love Shirley Jackson and it's gonna be fun rediscovering some of the stories that I've already read and who knows, like maybe, maybe she becomes a new favorite author or maybe I change my mind about the demon lover. Who knows, maybe it's a terrible short story. <laughs> doubt it. Um, highly, highly doubt that I'm ever gonna change my mind about that one, but Anyway, yeah, I'm just really excited to, yeah, dive in and read all of Shirley Jackson's short stories. And Shirley Jackson's complete short stories, at least in my edition, is 306 pages. I mentioned already that in June I'm reading Wolf Hall. Um, I have the entire Thomas Cromwell trilogy. And so for November, I'm planning on reading book three, the final book, uh, which came out in 2020. Um, and that is The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel. Because Bring Up the Bodies is like the shortest of the three books in the trilogy, um, I think I, it's going to be possible for me to just pick it up in any month, like in between June and November. Um, I don't think that's going to be too challenging for me. And it's good because it like ensures that I'm actually going to finish the trilogy by the end of the year. Um, I'm really liking Wolf Hall so far haven't finished. I'm not even halfway done with it, but um, I'm enjoying it. And yeah, the third book, the, the whole trilogy just follows Thomas Cromwell from the beginning of his life to the very end. And from what I've heard, The Mirror and the Light is maybe the slowest of the three, not as seductive as the other two. Um, and yeah, it just follows the final years of Thomas Cromwell as he gains more and more and more power. So yeah, I guess I'm just like really hoping that I end up loving Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies since I've chosen 
the third book for November. Um, but again, I'm determined. So whatever, whatever I feel about the first two in the trilogy, it's not going to affect the fact that I'm reading the third one for November. And it is 754 pages. And the last book, the one that I'm going to be reading in December, is The Crimson Petal and the White by Michelle Faber, which was published in 2002 and is 833 pages. And it tells the story of Sugar, who is a 19-year-old prostitute in Victorian London. Um, and it just, yeah, it follows her rise in society, um, her first true love. Meanwhile, there's a bunch of gossip and corruption and lies encircling her um, about her own life and her steady climb up the social ladder. I remember so many of like my favorite early YouTubers, booktubers, um, talking about this and raving about it. I know like Jen Campbell really loves Michelle Faber. I remember Chinsia from what is now Lady of the Library. Um, loving this book when she read it. I've heard it has gothic elements, which I love. I've been picking a lot of these books, if you haven't already been able to tell. Um, I've picked them sort of by the mood or the atmosphere that befits the month that I've chosen um, to read them. Um, and so I feel like December, it's cold, it's sort of moody. I feel like the gothic is like perfect for this time of year. I feel like there's something about like Victorian England and like these cozy gothic books that just is perfect for the winter. So yeah, The Crimson Petal and the White, it will be for December. Another one that has, I believe, a TV show adaptation. Haven't really heard anything about it, so don't know if it's worth even watching. Again, that's always like a perfect incentive for me to like pick up a book. Um, and I love like reading a few chapters and then like watching the episode that corresponds with those sections. I think it's really fun to sort of just see what you've just read visually um, as somebody else has interpreted. So these are all of the chunky, big, very intimidating books that I'm planning on reading from July until the end of the year. If you want to see what I end up thinking about these books, then, you know, just stay tuned and watch some of my monthly wrap-ups. Um, now that you know which book corresponds to which month, you can, you know, just wait for that monthly wrap-up and I'm sure to summarize just what I felt about the book. Overall, thank you so much for watching and I'm curious, you know, what is your favorite big book that you've ever read? And also, what is one intimidating big book that you haven't read that you really want to read by the end of 2022. I would love to see what all of you have to say, so make sure to comment down below, like and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!